So welcome to our section on Enterobacteriaceae. In this section, we're going to talk about different types of bacteria, which include common bacteria such as E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Shigella, and Salmonella. First, let's look at our clinical vignette and then move on to discuss the different characteristics of the Enterobacteriaceae family and these different bacteria. A 25-year-old woman presents with a one-day history of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. She has no significant medical history and denies any further symptoms. Physical examination reveals a patient with poor skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, and abdominal tenderness on examination. A stool culture reveals gram-negative rods that ferment lactose. The rods appear purple on McConkie agar. Which of the following organisms is responsible for this patient's diarrhea? Is it A, Proteus, B, Salmonella, C, E. coli, D, Klebsiella, or E, Shigella? So in this section, we're going to discuss the general properties of the Enterobacteriaceae. We already know that they're gram-negative rods, and therefore we know that they have certain characteristics if we recall our introductory videos on gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. We know that gram-negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharide in their cell envelope and that they also have an outer and inner membrane and very little peptidoglycan in their cell walls. We also know that they can have antigens in their cell envelope. So, for example, they have an O antigen, which refers to a part of the lipopolysaccharide, which is the polysaccharide part. They have a H antigen, which refers to the flagellum, which confers motility to the actual organism. And they also have capsular antigens referred to as K antigens. And together, the O antigen, the H antigen, and the K antigen allow one to serotype bacteria in this family into distinct bacteria. So they're really the general properties of Enterobacteriaceae. There are also some other properties we need to consider in terms of how they cause disease. In particular, we know that gram-negative bacteria produce endotoxins, or rather the endotoxin is a component of the lipopolysaccharide part of the cell structure itself. And this can lead to many of the rather manifestations or clinical features of inflammation and infection that one see in patients who are infected by these bacteria. We also should recognize that they also have a number of the invasive or pathogenic mechanisms um, similar to gram-positive bacteria. So these gram-negative rods will also produce exotoxins. And these are important when we consider the vignette in terms of the symptom of diarrhea, which can often be due to a particular exotoxin secreted by the actual bacteria itself. In terms of other pathogenic features we need to know about, these bacteria sometimes on their cell wall will have structures that allow it to adhere to certain mucosal membranes in the body, allowing it to adhere and penetrate into areas where the bacteria should normally not be found. And this um, allows it, therefore, to carry out disease in these parts of the body. For example, they have these structures called fimbriae, which are kind of small hair-like structures found on the cell wall, and adhesin molecules. And these pretty much do what they say. They allow the actual bacteria to adhere to the epithelialized surfaces of, say, your bladder, for example, causing cystitis or a renal tract infection. And that's one example of how these actually allow, to allow one to experience disease or, have, in other words, allow the bacteria to carry out disease. Let's look at the bacteria a bit further in terms of specific growth properties next. So we're going to discuss some growth properties of the Enterobacteriaceae. Firstly, let's talk about the common uh, properties regarding the growth of these organisms. So when you consider the class as a whole, all of them ferment or process glucose and break it down, and all are also oxidase negative. So there are two important things to remember about Enterobacteriaceae. When you actually look then at the different organisms, you can subcategorize them into two big groups, and that depends on whether or not they ferment lactose or not. So you have the lactose-fermenting Enterobacteriaceae, and these refer to particularly E. coli and Klebsiella, and you have the non-lactose-fermenting bacteria. So two examples here would be Salmonella and Shigella. 
Furthermore, all of these bacteria tend to survive well in the gastrointestinal tract, which is why they often commonly cause diarrhea when you get overgrowth or invasion of these bacteria. And one can really derive from this conclusion, or rather one can conclude from this uh, point, is that these bacteria work well in low oxygen or environments with no oxygen at all. And they're referred to as facultative anaerobes. So that's really the growth properties of Enterobacteriaceae. Just know, for example, that they have, um, they ferment glucose and they oxidase negative, and this is um, a common property to all these bacteria. And then you can subcategorize them into lactose fermenters, which would be E. coli and Klebsiella, and non-lactose fermenters, which Shigella and Salmonella would be two common bacteria here.